Hello. Good day. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, we thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Canyon Quejaca, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Most of us attending today are also on tradi traditional unceded territory. Today's session is the third of a series focusing on the new TSM protocols. And now, without further ado, I'd like to present the moderator of today's session, Teresa Keat, Senior Specialist Inclusion, Diversity and Equity, Human Resources at Chemico Corporation. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Mary Lou. Hello, everyone. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which I join you from is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of Cree peoples and the homeland of the Métis. As Mary Lou mentioned, today is the third session of a series of new TSM protocols, and the objective of today's session will be to support the development of respectful workplace cultures and the infusion of EDI into site-based processes. Focusing on Indicator 2, with connections to Indicator 3, as well as to deepen our capacity to engage diverse communities. Please note that a question and answer period will be allocated at the end of the session. Throughout the session, you might choose to type your questions into the chat area, and um, then we will address the questions during our Q&A period at the end. Um, so our first speaker today um, was, or one of our speakers today that was scheduled to join us, unfortunately, is unable to attend, and they do send their regards. Um, so first, our first speaker today is Leslie Wolcott, Director of Equity, in Diversity, and Inclusion with the Mining Industry HR Council. Leslie has 30 plus years of experience in EDI, human rights, and community development work locally, nationally, and internationally. She has facilitated collaboration across communities to support meaningful dialogue and systemic change. Most recently, she is bringing know-how to her PhD work in international relations. Leslie will be providing us with some overall context that in regards to the TSM EDI protocol. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm joining from the traditional Michisaugig Nishnabeg territory, the land associated with the Williams Treaty of 1923 and Rice Lake Treaty uh, 20 of 1818. My presence here in Nogojiwanang or Peterborough, Ontario, connects me to Kirb Lake First Nation, Alderville First Nation, Hiawatha First Nation, and the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation. Today we're uh, we're really looking forward to this opportunity to learn from uh, one another and exchange uh, some of uh, our knowledge and experiences as we work towards implementation of TS, the TSM protocols. And particularly, as Teresa mentioned, we're gonna focus in on indicator two today. So the next slide, please, Mary Lou. Just, just a reminder, that the TSM EDI Workplaces Protocol was recently created. And it, as I mentioned, it's the focus of our discussion today. The Safe, Healthy and Re Respectful Workplaces Protocol was revised to include an indicator focused on psychological safety and respectful behavior. And that will be a topic of discussion towards the end of uh, March in a session focused on, on that protocol. And as well that the TSM protocol on Indigenous and community relations is significant relate, significantly related to this work and these two additional protocols. Combined, the three protocols provide organizations with a, a, a very helpful roadmap for improving workplace culture, supporting dynamic problem solving that contributes to innovation and addressing talent needs uh, that relate to attraction, recruitment, retention, development, safety, and productivity, and amongst a number of uh, other elements of, of supporting and enabling talent to be, to be successful in the mining sector. Next slide, please. 
So indicator two brings the work uh, around corporate strategy that is the focus in indicator one to life by focusing in on the system structures and supports that will influence change in workplace culture. Uh, the second important contribution, and, and I've included on this slide the kind of overview quote that, that frames indicator two, is that it importantly contributes to uh, the engagement of relevant groups as part of implementing this systems change. And you'll find that the EDI protocol, and the protocol on Indigenous and community relations, provide guidance on how to define or understand uh, relevant groups as it's broadly uh, termed in the overview of the indicator too. So it refers in turn to local rights holders, communities of interest, local communities, relevant labor or worker groups, uh, people who bring diverse perspectives and experiences, for example, amongst the terminology that's, that's there. I'm going to ask folks to drop a thumbs up in the chat just to help us gauge if, if you would find it helpful to have more guidance on identifying relevant groups and understanding this meshwork of the different groups that are uh, identified in the, the TSM protocols and making sense of that. If that's helpful, if you would find that helpful, drop us a, a thumbs up in, in the chat or in the in the Zoom and we'll, we'll take an accounting of that. On to the next slide while folks are doing that. Thanks so much, Mary Lou. So all of the elements set out on this slide are identified in, on, in indicator two. And I want to just call out a few of them. So there's a very strong focus on workplace culture in indicator two. And you know, I say respectfully, as someone who loves policy, I love it. I'm one of the few people in the world who really does love, love good policy. But we do know that culture kind of eats policy for breakfast, as, as some are wont to say. So policy is your framework for dealing with complex matters and provides an important guide. Um, but culture is what we live every day, as everyone, uh, many know. And what we're working towards here, I think, in a, in proto indicator two is alignment with that policy piece that's set out in indicator one and alignment through workplace culture so that uh, we see advances as work uh, progresses and efforts progress here. So the other elements that I've listed that are listed or identified in indicator two also support uh, alignment. Um, including uh, moving EDI as an organizational approach out to engage contractors and align with procurement processes. processes. Um, I mentioned the piece about engagement um, and specifically indicator two speaks to engagement where designated uh, working collaboratively with designated communities where there are existing business or employment agreements. Um, this element of engagement requires very particular guidance and attention. Um, and we'll note that engagement broadly formed, you know, can take various forms and to be effective is differentiated according to objective and outcome with respect to particular communities. We've developed some tools around this um, at the Mining Industry Human Resources Council, which I can speak to, but feel welcome to drop a note in the chat indicating what kind of support you would find helpful, particularly with regard to collaboration with designated communities, because we do have some tools in development around that. We want to look to understand how to better support that. Indicator two also focuses on um, procedures and processes. Audrey's going to speak more to this, and this is where, where I'll point out that really the rubber hits the road in terms of activating EDI and workplace culture is changed uh, in turn as a result of uh, implementing these practices and processes, including the evaluation elements. Next slide, please. 
So in the previous session where we were corporate and focused more on the corporate section, I'll, I'll, I spoke a fair bit about integration as a key element of EDI change management. Um, we want to look a little bit at how Indicator 2 also supports this as, at a facility or site level. Again, I'll say that integration is a particular skill that takes time to develop and, and it involves, you know, very careful and thoughtful processes as many of us, you know, as all of us know. It's not about developing a separate EDI pillar of communications structure reporting, for example, but it, that can be a component or a step along the path. But ultimately, it's about embedding or integrating the structures, uh, EDI into your structures and functions to transform those uh those processes as they go along. And again, this integration is an ongoing process that requires uh, evaluation and taking stock. So let's chat a little bit about what that looks like at a, might look like at a facility level for the next two or three slides. So next slide, please, Mary Lou. So we want to look at that integration into the processes, and I'll speak more to the specific processes uh, identified in indicator two in the next slide, but we're looking at those processes. We're looking at integrating it into how we engage. We're looking at integrating it into training and then ultimately into culture. Now, the, recall from the previous uh, webinar, I talked about the, the, the trick being or one of the key tricks or skills being to contextualize it. So EDI is not a one size fits all and, and needs to be contextualized to an individual, a particular organization, a particular site, sometimes further contextualized in terms of departments, in terms of programs, in terms of teams. And so that that work can be supported through tools and resources, but it's also really well supported through dialogue of what others have found helpful, how that's worked in different places. And for that, we pro Mir has uh, their ensemble, our ensemble network that that uh, will help with that exchange of ideas and learning and effective practices. Next slide, please. So in previous sessions, I've shared uh, this graphic before, and now through, uh, as we get to this piece on uh, facility uh, implementation, um, I'm returning it to it today so that I can speak more to that center block around change management, um, which indicator two really focuses us in on um, uh, involving influencing workplace culture by creating a sense of shared responsibility for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And as I mentioned, this can be done by integrating it into roles, responsibility, and accountability structures, as indicated in indicator two, and supporting that with resources. So that can be resources that help with capacity development, resources that are budget focused, that are time focused, uh, that may even involve bringing in know that know how that helps uh, with that change management and contextualization process, so that everyone in the workplace can can link that and relate it to uh, their area of responsibility. Next, indicator two calls us to look at biases and barriers that are or may be affecting key processes, like. Uh, I won't say like, but indicator two actually specifies recruitment, performance skills, develop, uh, performance, skills development, retention, and advancement. These are critical uh, work related workplace cultures. Um, and I think naming these and setting these uh, setting these out in particular in the in the indicator is part of the strength of the standard, offering both a guide and identifying these as uh, part and parcel of an effective systemic uh, change management process. The next piece is that it, uh, the indicator uh, requires looking at patterns of inequity 
um, in relation to compensation and benefits. And I think it's important to think about those inequities in terms of access, opportunities, and outcomes. What are the effects that those compensation and benefits packages have? And how can inequities be uh, that may exist or are identified? How can they be addressed? Last, uh, the indicator gets at what I'll call representation and reflected, reflection. Uh, in, and, the, and it calls on us to have the workforce reflect local demographics and provide economic employment and training opportunities for local rights holders and members of underrepresented groups, as well as promote diverse representation based on positions that are recruited regionally or nationally. Um, and also importantly, it gets at identifying uh, pathways for diverse representation through throughout the organization. So again, we see this language in the in the indicator that speaks to different uh, elements of diversity. So local demographics, local right hold, rights holders, members of underrepresented groups, um, and getting more broadly at diverse representation in in terms of the whether you're having a regional or national uh, search for particular talent. So again, we're happy to provide some support around making sense of these different terms. Um, and mere, uh, some of the, what I want to say is that some of the, uh, the change management tools that we'll be talking about shortly will get at supporting implementation of those things, of these elements, and that these are all framed within um, this blue box, the blue boxes, which identify the, the training programs that we have made available. Now, turning to the next slide, I want to look a little bit at uh, relating EPI within the organization, and this touches on the training element. So, uh, at the last session I spoke about relating and and not only as a as an important element of helping people and teams and departments uh, to see their place uh, in implementing the protocol and advancing EDI within an organizational structure. So we've created this little a little bit of a a way this graphic as a way of thinking about you know, a, a journey uh, that individuals and teams may undertake as they enhance their understanding around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I want to just um, highlight that Ensemble can support that, but through the next slide, also talk about how training can support, um, can support this, but also throw this out as a little bit maybe of a, a topic for further discussion and dialogue where, you know, we offer these, uh, you know, there's training available. MIR has four, has or will have four program areas that it can support the sector with implementation of, of the standard, uh, the standards. Um, but we know that training is, is one measure amongst many. And so maybe we, I think that Audrey's going to touch on this and maybe in the Q and A, we'll have a little bit of discussion about what are the, what are the ways in which training can be effective. We have a sense, my experience has suggested that it's, it's a helpful tool, although it's not effective solely on its own. It does offer an important baseline of understanding. Um, sending messaging throughout an organization of of the importance of a particular topic or something that people are working to better understand. Um, but we know that it it's a complement, it's best if complemented with the other measures such as we've talked about today, the processes and integration into other um, into priority areas and areas of accountability and responsibility. I think it's also important to, to understand how we combine in-person and online uh, training, that this online training can be a gateway, 
but also as we work, as we move to advance things along that often there's a need for more uh, in-person uh, exchange and working through uh, some of these more complex issues. And so working in teams um, to make sense of and have exchanges around what has been learned or understood through engaging with an online training, integrating it into other training that happens such as uh, safety training or communications training, um, even uh, team building, problem solving training, any number of kind of training dynamics. And then uh, I'd, offer, I'd ask folks to offer any comments about how you use training, what you find the strengths and limitations are with regard to some EDI training and what it is that you, you know, you might find helpful and, and beneficial as you move through implementation of, of uh, Indicator 2. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, okay, so next I am pleased to introduce Audrey Limbitsky. Audrey is an industry expert in and human-centered innovation, social responsibility, and organizational transformation. Audrey is the founder and CEO of Team Synergy Global Consulting and the Senior Vice President of RGC Global Impact. With over 35 years of experience in business and leadership development and culture engineering, she has played a pivotal role in leading transformative change for organizations worldwide in sectors such as mining, resource, agriculture, education, healthcare, and economic development. In 2020, she released her preparatory methodology, Mind Your Mind, a comprehensive program focused on dismantling workplace inequities and injustices and opt optimizing psychological safety, fostering an inclusive workplace culture for dignity, respect, and belonging. Initially developed in 2015 for subject matter experts, large organizations, and nonprofit this program in partnership with her proprietary method of whole person safety is the first workplace safety model that has been strategically designed to mitigate the risks associated with psychosocial hazards and close the gap on the disconnect of understanding why without psychological safety, physical safety is at risk and all diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are not possible. Through Audrey's Proprietary and strategic methodologies, she has established extensive credibility as an expert speaker and facilitator and continuously demonstrates her devotion to creating a legacy of developing a future workforce where everyone feels confident to use their voice and is valued. So that collectively we can all create a generous global economy and generational sustainability for the future of humility. We are fortunate to have Audrey present to us today. Uh, I'd Thank like to you, pass Teresa. Over to Audrey to speak. You're welcome. Thank you. So first, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm leading and facilitating this virtually on the ancestral territory of Anishabek nations, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, who collectively are known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We remember too the people of the Wendat who once made this land their home. And we are, and I am personally committed to working in partnership with our indigenous people to restore wealth, health and prosperity for those before us and proactively create equality for the people of tomorrow. So Leslie, thank you for really helping create and defining those, um, that indicator because a lot of times when I'm working with organizations around the world, the word respect is something that's used in many contextual conversations as a concept versus what does that actually look like? What does it feel like? How does that real? And how does that apply to me as a leader? And how does it apply to the people that work for the organization? So first, what I want to do is just break that down a little bit. So dignity in the workplace is fundamentally about respect. That's what's important to really understand. 
and the recognition of everyone's intrinsic value. We as human beings each have value. Most of the times we go through life questioning, do we have value? So when we walk into work and there's an environment that has certain barriers that remind us individually that, do I have value? Do I belong here? What is my purpose? When we have all those types of questions that we're constantly asking ourselves because it was triggered by something we've seen, heard, experienced, we then begin to question, do I have value? And that leaves us in a space of being very disrespected. So it relates to how people feel about themselves and they are per perceived by others. Very important. When someone creates a convicted or conviction within their mind of who they are and how they are for others, they go around in the workforce with other people and they engage being that view versus being who they really can be. And so workplace respect is so fundamental in really driving an inclusive type of environment, an inclusive culture, because if it's not there, people are going to be left with the experience of, I do not belong. And when they say that to themselves, it's derived from a very real lived experience. So the world around them occurs like I don't belong. Next slide, please. So the development of a respectful workplace is creating a workplace environment where every employee feels valued, respected, supported, and safe. And the key word here is every employee. It's not about whether you're going to be always 100% effective. That's why we have feedback mechanisms. We want to hear from our people. We know what they have to say is important to us. We value it. We respect it. And we support it by being transparent, communicate it. And then creating these types of in continuous improvement strategies within our ED and I strategies that are going to help people feel more safe in their workplace. So, and it's regardless of their background or identity or any of their differences. So fostering that type of culture really leverages diversity as a source of strength. It ensures fair treatment and opportunities for all. It promotes open communication and mutual respect. And then really creating that sense of belonging and community among employees. And I, and I really want to emphasize on the terminology community among employees. So we must understand that our workplace environment is a social system. It's a human social system where we experience ourselves and we experience others. And what's important to connect is that how we experience ourselves is through our experience of our experience of another person's experience of us. And I know that can kind of sound kind of complicated, but if you really break that down, you only know you by your experience of someone else's experience of you. So when you have collectively the compound effect continuously happening within your workplace culture, where you're hearing things, where you're experiencing things that devalue and disrespect you, you begin to create this new version, this new identity of yourself. And then you begin to question, do I belong here? Next slide, please. So, so one phrase that I love in the uh, Towards Sustainable Mining the uh, protocol is new requirements related to psychological safety and respect in the TSM safe, healthy and respectful workplace protocol serves as an important basis for the achievement of equity, diversity and inclusion. This protocol is closely linked 
to the TSM Equitable, Diverse, and Inclusive Workplace Protocol. What's, what's really key here that I want you to focus on is that it serves as an important basis for the achievement of, okay, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Whenever I'm working with my clients, one of the first things I get them to connect the dots with and see for themselves is that without psychological safety and respect, your equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies and initiatives will not be effective. They will be the type of experience that people hear, but they don't implement. It'll be the type of experience that people may talk about for a short period of time, but it will not sustain itself within every fiber of the organization, therefore translating into creating those actual inclusive, psychologically safe, and respectful workplace cultures. Next slide. So connecting psychological safety and respect is critical because psychological safety generates a space for respect, not just generates a place of respect. So the for respect means if you are in an environment so when we talk about environments, there's something called the integrity of the environment. You become the space you're in. So now if we create a social system, a human social system of multiple people being in one environment, what is the integrity of that environment calling for? Is it calling for people to be discriminating, harassing, using disrespectful language and behaviors? Or is it calling for accountability? Is it calling for safety? Is it calling for dignity? Okay, so when we say psychological safety generates a space for respect, it really is the foundation of integrity that the organization is built upon. So security is a foundational element to actually facilitate ED and I strategies. So psychological safety provides a sense of security by influencing how people process information, how they perceive threats, how they make decisions in the workplace. People can sometimes be in front of another human being and right away they have these biases that create these automatic by default judgments. Okay, a lot of times, a lot of our biases are not our fault. We didn't, you know, we weren't born and then made a decision when we are were born that we are going to discriminate or we're going to be racist. We didn't just become born that way. We learned that type of thinking. Okay. And a lot of times, even though we don't think we're speaking it, that we're behaving in a certain way, that we don't have these certain microaggressions slip or that we didn't even pay attention to listen to somebody, or we believed that the only way to hold people accountable is to threaten them. Some of those things are there by default. But when you really learn the power creating psychologically safe spaces for people for the purpose of respect to grow and thrive in an environment, even if it's just you and another person, the way people process information begins to change. Threats don't always look like a threat. They now can sometimes transform into a space of compassion, transform into a space of empathy. So we hear the word psychological safety in our industry a lot right now. We're a little bit behind in that, in that area of conversation. In fact, the entire world is. Where we started to hear a lot about it is in emotional and ethical intelligence, becoming leaders that were emotionally and ethically intelligent type of leaders. Why? Because they intentionally practice how to listen, how to speak in an empathetic and socially, emotionally safe and ethical way. So, Psychological safety creates that space that not everything is a threat. In fact, 
It might be an opportunity. It might be that certain foundation where I feel so safe, I can speak up and, you know, correct people that are around me and say, that doesn't work for me and begin to teach them. So this sense of security can have a profound effect on a human being's cognitive functioning. Okay, so if you're really looking at some of the barriers we're dealing with today in an organization, especially when we talk about process behaviors, when we look at these protocols, ED and I, for the most part, is a theory. It's conceptual for people. We weren't born, we didn't learn it in school since junior kindergarten or whatever level of school we all started. We didn't learn it as a theory. We practice it by default naturally because children have an element of empathy that adults don't. But now as adults, we're needing to bring in these types of training and education to help unlearn a lot that we've learned just by living and going through life. Next slide. So what is psychological safety? There's a lot of definitions out there, but what's important, especially when you're looking at these indicators and the TSM framework is that psychological safety is a practical behavior concept that is recognized as a critical need of human interaction and human social systems. It refers to creating an environment that occurs to a person as safe and not as a concept, but as a lived experience. So every one of us has a personal worldview and that personal worldview sets those beliefs about aspects of our current reality. So when we say current reality, meaning what is happening right now in this moment? What is my lived experience? Okay, now as a human being, I am going to perceive what my lived experience is. I'm gonna think through my lived experience. I'm gonna know things like as if I know what's gonna happen next. And I'm going to do things, meaning I'm going to react, respond, okay? So when we look at things like conflict resolution, conflict resolution is all about how do we bring peace, harmony, resolution, and alignment to human beings occurring world in that moment, their lived experience, because every one of us on this call right now has a different occurrence of this experience of this webinar right now. Every one of us has that. Every single person you ever interact with, you're talking to them, they're talking to you. You've got that many different personal worldviews that are operating by default in the background that's interacting with dialogue, body language, in reality, in people's lived experiences. Okay, next slide. So we, we have these frameworks, we create these plans, now what, okay? One of the most difficult things I think that I hear or that I know that I hear when we're working with our clients, no matter where they are in the world, no matter where, what type of industry that they're in, but specifically in the resource industry, is that the implementation of a process and then holding people accountable to the process is one of the most challenging things, okay? Why? Because every single human being has something called behavioral processes. So a process behavior. You have a style, just like the way you write, the way you think, the way you walk, the way you express yourself. We each have these types of behaviors that communicate and show and reveal the way we process information, the way we implement processes, okay? But if we look at one, there's one statement that is really powerful in the framework, and that's together. And you really want to break these words down. I, I, a, I specialize in the science of language. And that's why communication is so important to me, because when we write something, that's why policies, I, I'm also a lover of policies. 
Um, and so when you write something, every word matters. And how it's configured in a statement matters. So I love this because it's very powerful. Together, we aim for a mining industry that reflects the diversity of the countries and communities. You don't hear that consistently across most mining organizations, but that it reflects the diversity of the countries and the communities where we operate and demonstrates a culture of belonging and inclusion where everyone is welcome, safe, respected, valued, and empowered to excel. If we built our entire EDI strategy on that statement alone, and we created an implementation plan based on that strategy alone, we probably in a very short period of time collectively, globally, to transform the way the mining industry occurs for the rest of the world and the way it occurs right now for ourselves on this call and for the workforce that we are in service of. Next slide. So how do we get there? Well, the first thing, and Leslie spoke a little bit about it in terms of biases and barriers, okay? So to get started, the first thing you need to do is identify your barriers. So if you look at the wheel, that is your organization. That's mostly all the areas that create a system, okay? Your culture is engineered within each one of those elements. Our job in order to begin and, and, and really develop things in the most effective way and be successful at an EDI strategy and framework is to identify the hazards within each one of those areas, okay? So that entire thing is called a system. What hazards, specifically psychosocial hazards, exist within the current system? So it's, it's really when we walk into an organization, the first thing we do is we go there. So we hear a lot of comments. We hear a lot of residual type of sharing and survey responses that speak to the lived experience. But if I was to go back and do a root cause assessment on an accumulation of lived experience that come from uh, feedback surveys, I would be able to bridge it back, bring it back to some type of psychosocial hazard that is embedded into the system. And for the most part, we've adopted the systems that are already there. We all were born and we were born into an assist a system. What we call an assist a system is an agreement reality. There's an agreement that is real for us. That's the system, okay? So when we talk about breaking down those barriers, dismantling racism, dismantling harassment, dismantling all these types of things that segregate people and have people feel excluded, okay? By doing that, you need to understand that in the real world, policies in that person's lived experience or practices and standards may not include them. And if they're not included, that's a barrier. And if there's a barrier, they're excluded. Next slide. So barriers create disrespect. Having Doing an assessment is critical. So when you look at the TSM framework and the indicators and you look at the ratings, AAA, AA, B, and C, you want to get interested. Whether something is mandatory or impacts your license to operate or not, what you need to understand is that if we do not become responsible collectively for the barriers that ongoingly disrespect people, whether they're intentional or not, you, we're collectively going to continue to have shortage in our workforce. We're going to continue to be talking about how do we navigate through the challenges of empowering a diverse workforce. 
continue to have these challenges when it comes to having these treaty agreements and these land agreements and resource agreements on land that is owned by our First Nations people. We're gonna continue to have this type of barrier. And when you have barriers of disrespect, what you have is you don't have inclusion because exclusion is an opposing force of inclusion. So that's why it's very important to break down the barriers, get real. It doesn't mean just by doing an assessment, you're gonna have to fix everything tomorrow. But when you can identify, when we can hear things like a Rio Tinto report, Goldfields report, and it's been transparent and publicly aware, all of those, that entire framework to bring integrity to creating a respectful workplace environment, it's not gonna happen overnight. The budgets are not always gonna be there. But if we are not identifying, being transparent about those ex exclusion types of indicators, those disrespectful indicators, those barriers, and then draft an implementation plan with a timeline, with ongoing communication with our workforce, we are gonna lose our people, okay? Next slide. So when we look at barriers by default, these are many of the barriers that organizations are working with right now. So if we go back to policies being very important. So policies is something that not everybody creates them as actionable. They create them almost to be and sound like a mission statement, specifically in the ED&I space. Why? Because there's not a lot of training and awareness how to actually create an actionable policy. So inadequate policies that, you know, really we want them to promote respect and address disrespectful, disrespectful behaviors. Or poor communication is a barrier that can lead to misunderstandings that create a perception of disrespect. And this is why cultural diversity, this is why training, unconscious bias, lack of awareness is so important. Because for the most part, when we work with a lot of people, there are people that are just, and I wanna use the word ignorant respectfully, is that we're just sometimes ignorant to the reality of someone else's occurring world and how their lived experience is in that very moment. When we're unaware that there are certain things in their culture that if we don't do, they feel disrespected, even if it was unintentional. And then there's a diversity deficit. Diversity deficits is is really all about learning to include people based on their diverse needs. And sometimes there's a lack of understanding or a lot of times there's a lack of understanding, especially at the leadership level, that that diversity is so needed in order to really foster a culture of a workplace respect and psychological safety. So again, for ED and I initiatives to really work, you need to focus on what do I need to diversify? Where am I deficient? Where are those barriers? Even the things that you're not sure occur there, ask, they're there, okay? So this is very important because if you're not aware of the barriers, you really cannot begin to effectively implement your equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies. Okay, next. So it, the mining industry, it has, you know, some of its unique challenges. And, you know, for the most part, when we go in and we do assessments on the built environment, there are mine sites we walk into that, I mean, even just recently, 70 years old, whether it's 20 years old and up, most of these male dominated industries, mining the resource, oil and gas, metals, 
these types of environments were not made for women, okay? So we really need to look at that unless we begin to implement and shift and change, you know, these types of facilities, the infrastructure, we are going to automatically discriminate, okay, by default, even if it's not intentional, even if you've got a really good reason, they're going to automatically discriminate, at least in that person's worldview, their own lived experience. So you want to ask yourself, if I don't have facilities that can support all genders, then how am I to attract all genders into my organization, okay? So the other thing I want you to focus on is rugged work culture. Mining has been known as a tough industry, okay? It's, and, and, and there are times it's even glorified. Our clients right now work in so many different parts of the world. And before this call started, I was sharing that with um, Mary Lou, Teresa, and Leslie. And I was just talking about the time zone, the time difference. You know, some of these things that we need to work through when we're working in different time zones. Many of you could be in roles where you've got a role that's accountable globally. Okay, so you also have to accommodate all these time zones. But what's very interesting that I always like to do more research on is this thing called the tough industry. And there are certain cultures that glorify being rough. Okay, so being strong, tough, let's muscle through it. I have heard women downplay their experiences because they don't want to be excluded. So as a result, to feel that they belong and to get the respect from their coworkers, they're like, I just need to tough it up. I just need to suck it up and move on. And these types of things are real for people, okay? So resistance to change, your diverse workforce, communication barriers. This is a very big one, especially when we talk about the statement that I read previously a few slides ago. We really are looking to create a mining industry that's respectful, that's safe, that's inclusive and diverse for all countries, for all communities. We need to get to the fundamental needs, the basics. And one of the basics is language. So there are organizations that will have sometimes up to three or four different distinct languages within that culture. And then they're trying to create an organization of one culture. You cannot do that when you have three micro cultures built in by default within that one working culture just by language. Okay, so really creating language and clear communication so there are no misunderstandings and so there is no disrespect. Next slide. So everything starts with EDI policies that are actionable. Again, I'm a lover of policies. Why? Because without a policy, nothing's going to get done. Something will start but it will not continue. You will just like project management, you will begin the initiation phase, but it's very rare that you'll get to the monitoring and control and closing phase when it comes to your ED&I policies. And so uh, yeah, ED&I strategies and initiatives. So the infusion of EDI into site-based processes must begin with a policy. Okay, so you want to take your policies and that's where everything begins. That's like your framework. So one of the things that I wanted to offer you is really begin today to go look at some of your policies. 90% of the clients we walk into when we go and we are doing assessments and I read their inclusion and diversity policies, their, their EDI policies, their their DEI and B policies, however, whatever acronym that you are going to be using, I'll be read it and it sounds like a mission statement. It sounds like a vision. It sounds like this is what we want to do. 
fine, but how are you going to do it? How do I hold people accountable to a policy? Can I create, develop standards and processes if I don't have an actionable policy. So these are some key things that must be built into your policy. So a little assignment for when you go home, sorry, sorry, go back to work, it's like our home. When you go back to work is really look at it and break it down. So policy should clearly specify the actions required. It must include measurable goals and objectives. Policy should set achievable goals, okay? So you can't just say, we're going to do this. We're gonna meet a certain metric and say la vie, it's going to happen. No, realistic expectations are important. And how we get there is we generally bring in a group of people that collectively are gonna to begin to engage in the conversations of the implementation of those metrics and those timelines, okay? So you really wanna consider the resources and the constraints. In the industry we're in right now, one of the things that is one of the top disrespectful types of lived experiences, us in mining experience, is respect for people's timetable, time agenda. So the last thing you wanna do is add something to the plate like it's coming down the pipeline from the head office that it's an expectation and not have your people included in it, okay? So the flexibility, there needs to be flexibility to accommodate different departmental needs, okay? There are unforeseen challenges that certain departments have. So when you're drafting these types of actionable EDI policies, you want to get to know your people. If you don't know your people, you are not going to know what they need. And your people, each team, each department in your organization is its own separate human social system. What we need to understand is each department has its own culture. There's a personality of that department. There's a consistent flow of behaviors within that department, okay? So your action, your policies need to reflect that. And then accountability mechanisms, clearly defined mechanisms for accountability, okay? And then resources and support. Policy should outline the resources available, okay? There are many times that coming down from the top that there's an expectation that we are gonna move this across the board. We're gonna move this across the organization no matter where they are in the world, no matter how many employees they have, no matter what the climate of that organization is dealing with at the moment. But when you don't have the resource support, when you don't have what you need, if you don't have that go-to, then you are just setting your people up for failure. And we gotta remember bottlenecks, okay? Bottlenecks, bottlenecks in the EDI space, and I'm saying this with all love, due and respect to everybody, generally is going to happen at the top, okay? Because when we have a force down approach to anything, it's ineffective. Next slide. So quickly here for the next couple of slides, it's really about now, okay, great. We have this EDI initiative. We want to have psychological safety as an experience for our workforce. And we want everybody having the experience that they are respected. Okay, great. How are we gonna do that? What does it look like? What's the practical application of it? Okay, so again, when you're able to identify your barriers and the constraints that are causing those barriers,
Hi, I'm just wondering, I saw you mentioned in the chat that I'm having a technical issue and others are as well. Can someone mention if they can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So maybe it's Audrey's on Audrey's end. Teresa, why don't we, I can pick up, I suggest I can pick up my piece and if Audrey is able to rejoin, we can circle back okay. to, how does that sound? Perfect. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, it's hard with on the technical side to know if it's you or that you or <laughs> that. So thanks everyone for our patience as we just worked through that quickly. So I will pass it back to Leslie to provide us with some additional context and to further connect our the mirror tools that she was mentioning. Um, yeah, and if Audrey joins us, then we'll then we'll re reset from there. But yeah, please continue on, Leslie. Thank you. Sounds good. And we, maybe uh, depending on how things go, then we can either circle back to Audrey or move on to trying to address some of the questions that have have arisen, and then we'll see where we land. Okay. So thank you, Mary, for putting that slide up. That's much appreciated. So as mentioned in previous uh, in previous sessions, Mir has been fortunate to work closely with Mac in the development of the protocol, uh, uh, this one, the EDI protocol, and the reside, revised Safe, Healthy, and Respectful Workplaces protocol. We're also happy, moving on to the next slide, to share that we've created a number of materials to help support implementation. And I'll just say that the toolkit involves uh, the creation of guides that uh, are focused on one guide for each indicator plus one guide on this uh, more important issue of supporting a collabor collaborative uh, process for validating community identity and for engaging with uh, Indigenous rights holders communities. Um, then there are a series of tip sheets, which are meant to serve as a bit of quick reference for moving through some of the indicators. And there are postcards and infographics. And then what we're also doing is creating a matrix that will help uh, users to understand which of the tools relate to which of the, which of the criteria and indicators, as well as we've group them also by a, in a second way by thematic areas like planning, like engagement, um, like training, so that if people are thinking more thematically as they move to implement uh, TSM, then they'll be able to line that up with the appropriate tools uh, in the toolkit. And then just going on to the next slide, uh, all of the materials that we develop will be in English and French. Um, they're meant to complement these training programs that are identified in these uh, four squares. So the toolkit creates that change, that capacity, supports the capacity for change management and integration into the processes uh, that are identified in TSM and mirrors training on Indigenous awareness, uh, on gender equity and mining, which uh, includes sections on intersectionality, uh, gender identity, gender expression, gender diversity, as well as a, a fourth module on uh, sexual harassment and gender-based violence in the sector. Our uh, intercultural awareness training, which is actually a nice gateway or introduction to a number of these uh, issues and, and practical applications in, in implementation. And then we've also, we're also just putting, putting the finishing touches on a modules and program focused on bias and systemic uh, racism. So these provide a bit of a backdrop or platform from which the change management tools can also be engaged. And in keeping with TSM, uh, and the specification in TSM that organizations may, uh, you know, initiate or work and focus in on making improvements with respect to inclusion and representation and reflection of any one community or more communities. Um, and so I think, Tori, you've got a question in here. Somebody's got a question around, you know, how many aspects of identity can we interface with? How do we grapple with intersectionality? 
some of that training will help with that, but also TSM provides for um, looking at uh, a, a group or a community, if you will, uh, that we count amongst our underrepresented groups. And I can share some more information about that also uh, in terms of how we at MIR identify uh, equity deserving groups. Key to that, key to that approach to any one particular community is, is working through intersectionality as well and applying that lens of intersectionality. So moving specifically on to indicator two in the next slide, that, and I spoke about this, but I think it's relevant uh, with regard to both indicator two and indicator one, this case for advancing equity, valuing diversity and practicing inclusion in mining. We've created that case where you see that uh, there's a question about um, the like uh, grappling with resistance from different uh, areas within an organization, and I think that this case will help with some of that. And I have more thoughts on that also for our discussion. And then we have the guides and infographics that we have related to indicator two are a guide on putting EDI into action. And as I mentioned, that guide to community identity and collaboration. We've got tip sheets on engaging communities of interest, fostering an EDI postcard on fostering an EDI workplace culture. And then we've got a bit of a template around gathering demographic data. Many of you may recall that this past spring, we undertook our own barriers research and we've turned the, some of the demographic data gathering tools we used for that into a, an accessible tool for you that you can um, borrow from for your own purposes and adapt from your own purposes. Um, and I say that 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 template of those indicators was you was developed in consultation with subject matter experts in the area. So that in itself can be a very sensitive piece around how you ask questions or uh, related to identity. And so we tried to make that suitable to the mining sector at this time. So with that, I think I see that Audrey is back on. Audrey, we're sorry we lost you. We're glad to see you back. Thank so you, thank you. We, we have a storm here right now. And anyways, I was able to get internet from my phone. So I'm hoping that everything is clear and you can see and hear me. I apologize. Um, where, where was I, Leslie? Was it this slide? I think you were on this slide. So we'll turn it back to you if that works. Okay, thank you, thank okay. you, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Leslie. Um, so yes, so the practical application, but what I, and, and, and the two, ones at the bottom community engagement okay so when we're creating the practical application of inclusion and we're looking at that statement at the beginning of those slides the tsm statement where we were talking about countries and communities and that we welcome everyone so there is a way in which it looks to have that experience for people and it really falls under the community engagement and supplier diversity aspects. So when you're engaging with, with local communities is to ensure the mining operations respect their rights and cultural heritage. Okay, there are so many times, there's a couple of, of organizations we've worked with that I, I have so much great respect for the team and the initiative where, you know, we would be walking down and this was actually during um, COVID and the lockdowns and everything, but as a, um, the type of workers that we were, we were able to travel in, in at that time, but all along the walls, there was, um, stories and symbols that represent the First Nation community that was in that area, so the Teltan community. And because the Teltan was such a large population of the workforce, it was so evident in the culture. It was like you would walk into the camp and you would feel the culture. You wouldn't just feel the people, but you would feel the culture. And it was something that is very highly respected that we don't do enough of. So that's just one example that when you're in the when you're doing community engagement initiatives, 
as a mine site, don't just go and work outside of the facility, bring it into the facility symbolically every way that you can. And again, supplier diversity, making sure that your procurement process, that your policies, your procurement policies really begin and include diversity in terms of women-owned, Indigenous-owned businesses, and of course, local community. Okay, next slide. So if we were to break down integrating EDI into the day-to-day -day operations, it could look like, and these are just some examples, these are things that have worked for us in the past when we've initiated it with our clients, inclusive meetings, okay? things. There are certain things about meetings people don't think about. Ensure meetings are accessible for all employees. So we don't mean accessible just from a physical needs perspective. We're not just talking about um, wheelchair accessibility or ergonomics or signage. We're talking about clearly defined also roles that every person has as they participate in those meetings so that their voice is welcome. They know this is my prompt, my voice matters, it's valued. Okay, rotating meeting times to accommodate different shifts around the world. I have to tell you, when this one action is implemented in mining organizations that have multiple locations around the world in different time zones, it is like a game changer in the culture. It's almost like, wow, you value my life, you value my time and you get it. And when people are left gotten, by an experience that they they can hear you heard they can experience that you listened and that you did something about it it actually can begin to transform that culture really elevating respect so that's one simple thing that can be done that's a game changer okay safety gear everything from really looking is our ppe really designed for all body types. Okay, I, I, I led um, a webinar last week and I shared the CSA report that 40% of women's accidents in the, um, in the trades industry, which includes mining, happens because of not proper fitting PPE. But it's not just about PPE for women. It's also about different hair types, religious headwear, weather conditions. So you have some people having to walk to a portable bathroom outside that can have severe cold, severe heat, but have the same uniform. And there's only certain times of the year that, ah, oh, this feels good, right? So these are the things that you can do to integrate diverse needs that are equitable, that are inclusive. Equitable also means equal access to fundamental needs. Equitable means like knowledge equity, making sure everybody has the same, same level of knowledge and access to that knowledge, okay? Cultural awareness, again, recognize and celebrating various cultural holidays. Workplace interactions, encourage employees to respect gender identities, respect family and personal life balance. It doesn't mean they need to give up a part of themselves. It doesn't mean they need to believe in something that they don't truly wholeheartedly value or believe in. But inclusion, respect looks like, but I'm not going to disrespect another person because of my beliefs, okay? And then have a zero tolerance policy for discrimination. Any types of jokes, jokes are discrimination. Jokes can sometimes land as what we call as microaggressions, like sarcasm, okay? And make sure there's clear consequences. Okay, next. And then integrating ED and I into the decision-making process. So when we're looking at, hey, how do we actually do this? Well, you've got to begin by a group of people making decisions. What's the framework in which they make their decisions? A lot of times there's things coming down from management that things are being done. And one of the things that the work you'll hear the workplace say a lot is, do they really expect us to do this now? 
How do I do this? I wasn't aware of the other situation. There's all these misconceptions. And that's when we bring it back to change management. There is psychological phases to change, okay? So when you are making decisions, there is a way to integrate ED and I into that decision making process. So from recruitment and hiring, that there could be blind recruitment processes, you want to be looking at your onboarding. Does your onboarding minimize everything from transparency and lack of transparency? Or does your onboarding already begin to create an unsafe space? and lack of trust for people because they feel information was withheld from them. And then if we go to training and development, training is critical, okay? So there's a, it, it's very important to distinguish when we talk about training and development. So if you break that down, training is learning something, okay? You're learning something theory, you're learning something conceptually. It's knowledge, okay? Development means you're developing people into that space, into that skill. You're developing them into what they learned. So training and development is written that way distinctly, intentionally, okay? So when we say we're gonna train and develop our people, it's what they learn they need to put into practice. And the only way to put things into practice is you gotta hold people accountable. And then again, resource allocation. Allocate resources for the creation of facilities like prayers rooms, mother's rooms, invest in community development projects. And see, a lot of that can even fit under your, your social performance, your ESG budgets, okay? So when you're looking at, okay, what, what metrics? When we, when we look at the math of ESG, the finance, the financial aspects of ESG, we always need to ask ourselves, what are we going to commit to? Well, first you need to know, what am I going to measure? Okay, so there's a lot of information in your ED and I strategies and in the TSM framework that can really also drive and support your commitments and initiatives for ESG. Okay, and I think the next slide is the last one, okay. So by systematically applying EDI continuous improvement frameworks, you can work towards integration EDI principles into every aspect of your organization. To really sum up and simplify, if we look at that wheel that had the circle and the hazards in it, if we are able to look at our system that might contain barriers and you wanna assume, go in with the assumption they're there, whether you can see them or not, okay? So by applying EDI continuous improvement frameworks, so like the protocols where depending on a AAA, AA, it's how often are you measuring? How often are you serving? You know, the types of initiatives you've put in and how are they working? That's part of your feedback mechanism, which is part of your continuous improvement. But EDI actionable policies and procedures are critical to start. They speak to the how and translate. And then that translates the how into a process and a standard that you can hold your workforce accountable to. And then accountability drives the processes practices and behaviors. And those practices and behaviors create a culture of respect. So this is almost a very simple way that if you follow that and, and, and really look at all the resources that are available to you, that's how you're gonna create that respectful workplace culture. Okay. And that's it. So the last words I wanna leave you with is when it comes to workplace respect, it's from the ground level, your frontliners, all the way up to the top level boardroom. There is no one needs it more than the other. It's a collective action, okay? And it's important to remember that it's not a one-time project. And Leslie made reference to that. And that's why measuring and serving is so important because as your continuous efforts evolve, so does your organization and the community that it serves. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you.
turning it thank back to Rosemary. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. So we have a few minutes for questions. There was a couple that were shared in the chat. I'll just loop back to our first one. And the first question that we received in the chat was um, written, Leslie, when you were speaking in, in the first, um, in your first session. And it asks what approaches are suggested to adopt to create balance with protocols and culture. So I think that I think the protocols give a roadmap. Like they they set out the steps to changing culture, you know, developing these strategic uh, tools like policy, like uh, corporate strategy, like action plans that help will that will help change with that and have that in, impact on culture. Um, so I think if 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 an organization looks at the the protocol and does a bit of an inventory of where they're on, take stock of where you're at and take stock of, you know, where you can reasonably go and then how over the long term you can move along with the implementation of the strat of the protocols, you'll be well on your way. It's a I think it's a gap analysis to start with. Thank you. I think the second question you did address when you spoke the second time, it had um, the second question was related to patterns and in, in inequity and what that looks like, kind of established measures, and then what lens of intersectionality. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add, or I, I do think you addressed it in your seconds? Sure, and I can take that up with Tori uh, individually okay. if she needs more more information particular to her organization. Perfect. And the other question we received was when, Audrey, you were discussing your barrier slide. And this question was, what are the first steps to removing barriers, especially where there is resistance from the managerial bodies? Hmm. Okay, so whenever we want to initiate change, we need to quantify it. Okay. So if we look at, we're going to start by identifying what the barriers are. The first step would really be to bring it to the numbers. So let the numbers do, let the data do the talking. Okay. And there are ways to internally measure the impacts, the negative impacts from some of the barriers. And again, if you're going to go to management to get things started, you don't want to show them everything. You want to look at, okay, what are those gaps and then begin to prioritize them. Okay. I always, when we initiate any type of implementation plan, we prioritize quick wins first. Why? Because those quick wins are going to create that momentum. You're going to get more buy-in from the culture. Your, your management is going to get, you know, they're going to be less resistant because they're going to have more evidence that something is moving in the right direction. But again, you got to quantify it and bring it back to the data. So if you were to look at some of the barriers, the let's say one of the psychosocial hazards is job control and clarity of a role. OK, so it could be as simple as sometimes a job description that was posted when someone applied for the job is not necessarily what they're doing every single day. And something as simple as a clear role description that could be owned by the managers to redefine them, get them clear, and then have that be implemented with each one of their team members. It's a way to engage with the team, but it's also something that will have time attached to it. So that's the resource of time you're using, but you may not need to outsource that. So there's less, there's less investment into doing certain things like job control. If you really look at the so uh, psychosocial hazards, you'll be able to identify for yourself automatically oh that's a barrier that's a barrier we just don't know it's a hazard so we don't know we're actually disrespecting people so again in short quantify look at the quick wins look at something that you can easily own within your organization build the momentum prove the change that change matters and then you you begin the process 
Thank you, Audrey. I think, Leslie, did you have anything to comment? I, I love what Audrey said. And I'm going to add one little piece. It's like a little nugget. Uh, everybody has lots going on on their desktops. People are in, like, desktops are loaded. People are in, implementing programs. They've got initiatives. They've got deliverables. They've got all kinds of, and then there's the things that people love to do, right? The thing I find, the one little trick I have found helpful is when you know whether it's a leader or a super, you know, someone, it's someone who's even informally, like, however they're recognized, whatever their role is, if you want to get them on board, talk to them about how this EDI relates to what they're trying to do. So when I was working in a large decentralized organization, people would say, like, Leslie, you're all over the place. You're in all of these different corners of the organization. And I'd say, that's because I'm not, get, I don't want to get people onto the EDI bus. I want to get onto their bus that they're trying to drive through the organization and talk to them about how EDI is important to them, how it's going to make their work better and more effective. So that's a little trick. I hope it's helpful. Leslie, can I just add one little element to that? Because that was so powerful. And, and if you really hear what Leslie said by incorporating EDI, you, the way to language it, because language is, is everything, you, the way in which it occurs to somebody has to be authentic, right? So you can powerfully drive EDI into the conversation by saying, how would you being included in this process impact you? How, what needs would we meet of yours? if we were able to accommodate this need for you. So if you're using simple language that is really equity driven from equity, diversity and inclusion, they now can relate and connect to it. And that's what it looks like to have it be embedded in real lived experience for people. Cause that's, that's such a powerful access to elevating EDI in the workplace and using less acronyms. I always believe in less acronyms. We're over acronyms. Yes. Thank you both. So just being mindful of time, I did think we got to the core of the questions of in the chat as well. So happy to have seen we were able to do that. There was a question on if we'll see these notes. And I think that links to the fact that there will be a, rec a recording of this session that will be made available. So I don't think the slide specifically, but the recording can be referenced. And I see that um, Mary Lou has shared that link in the chat. So I just want to thank um, Leslie and Audrey for joining us today and sharing their expertise and to everyone that attended the session. Um, session four on equity, diversity, and inclusion indicator number three of the TSM protocol is scheduled for Wednesday, March 13th. So there'll be notices related to that. Please register for that. And thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.